Yeah, Joshua. Joshua. Oh, okay. Allora, good morning. Uh, buongiorno. Good morning, anyone. Secondo giorno. Let's get started with the second JODS workshop. So the topic of this session is innovation, technology, production, and commerce. Our first speaker this morning is Fabrizio Antoni Ansani, researcher in the Department of Historical Sciences in Padua, specialized in history, in modern history. He had already took part in another week. This was the year in 2015. It's up to you. Fabrizio Antonio Ansan is going to speak Italian, and you will get English translation through the earphones. Thank you. Buongiorno a tutti. Volevo innanzitutto ringraziare il Comitato Scientifico per aver accettato la mia proposta uh, su un tema che nelle ultime settimane sembra essere nuovamente, tristemente, tornato d'attualità. Più che di guerra, tuttavia, vorrei parlare oggi ovviamente di economia, parlando di industria bellica in termini di trasmissione della conoscenza. Italiani. Can you hear me now? Okay, allora mi sposto di qua. I'm sorry, but the system was not working. Okay. Eh, mi dispiace, io l'avevo acceso. Eh. Sì, sì, please, please, go ahead. Okay, sì, prego. Okay, I will start all over again. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the scientific committee for accepting my proposal. A proposal on a topic which is now, is becoming more and more important. I would like to tell you about economics. Speaking about war industry and knowledge transmission and overcoming the guilt secret as well as incentives to innovation as well as uh, mercantile accounting tools by state systems as well as provision of raw materials and labor, um, more or less skilled, just to go back to some of the problems we dealt with yesterday. Okay, let's go ahead. In 1495, uh, the Artillerie Royale by Charles VIII had really impressed ambassadors, warmen, and Italian princes, the foreign weapons which were considered as not human at all, were astonishing because they were very effective and they were destroying fortresses in just a few hours or days. Many chronicles were remembering the terror induced by the most beautiful artillery ever, and other chronicles uh, observed the innovative features of these weapons, a different, uh, just one, spe one piece and very, very long, made in bronze. And, uh, uh, but they only used uh, iron uh, bullets, uh, and this artillery was uh, carried on wheels, uh, smaller or younger, uh, uh, smaller or bigger, according to the weight. Uh, 
the witnesses uh, could hardly believe what they were saying. And they were moving very quickly and in flat areas, especially in flat areas, and they were very they were moving very quickly, but not just on the flat uh, surfaces, but also in the mountain. The impressive mobility of transalpine artillery were crashing with the fact that Italian bombers were very, very uh, slow. Their use had been affected by the logistic preparatory work and the large expense. Since they were very, very large, quoting these uh, uh, weapons, according to Guirinduccio, were requiring the use of uh, animals to be placed, uh, and many cars had to be taken to carry the very weight of stone bullets and the wooden structures supporting the machinery. Then it was easier to use and to lead the modern cannons, and they represented the perfect response to the problem of siege war, a solution so convincing to be adopted soon by all governments of the country. Within the end of the century, within 1499, five years after their first appearance, the so-called French pieces were made in Naples, Rome, Venice, Lucca, and also Pisa, also thanks to the skill, the experience, and the adaptability of local founders. In the Ferrara area, the use of French artillery led to the startup of plants just for weapon production, cart and bullets, an example that was followed by the Duke of Milano. The great effects had been appreciated and the officials of the Republic of Florence decided to adopt the weapons of transalpine invaders and to foster the development of war production. In February 1495, therefore four months after uh, Charles VIII coming to Tuscany, uh, the military court had made an agreement, beautiful models so as to produce artillery received by some French trying to reproduce the perfect systems. For the very same region, two Florentine artisans had been asked to, to take the measures and to design piece by piece some of the foreign weapons so as to make them from scratch for the needs of the city of Florence in order for their best use to be possible. The imitation of manufacture would once again become a very important uh, mean for uh, knowledge transmission. In March of that year, the first Cortal de la Francese was being sent to the army that was dealing with the repression of Pisa rebellion. The several events of this conflict would lead the Republic of Florence to be equipped uh, with a growing number of bronze cannons and to accumulate uh, uh, sufficient strategic reserves of raw materials and commodities uh, needed for their pr fabrication. The general captain launched a very quick uh, siege, uh, 32 uh, bocche da fuoco with 16 tons of metal alloy in the summer of 1498 from June to August. A very important effort made by the continuous recycle of, of waste material and the large quantity of both copper and tin sold by local entrepreneurs. The, incre the increase in the demand uh, leading the Dieci di Balia to make uh, new uh, foundries in uh, Volterra, Florence, and Fiorenzola Castle, and the authorities were paying for these artisans. The two furnaces of the municipality in Florence had been renovated and enlarged, and in the capital city, uh, some other uh, private uh, workshops had been involved that would be making very good artillery thanks to the very important experience in the art sector, like, for example, Ghiberti Foundry. Besides using the local masters, the Florentine government also tried to hire some foreign artisans, especially French artisans, so as to improve the acquisition of techniques and knowledge dis dissemination, together with the use of the ambassadors present in the Italian and European courts. The use of transalpine technology, however, 
not, did not just uh, uh, concern the imitation of uh, a fire weapon, but also the replica of an overall productive system aimed at uh, making it uh, work properly. In order for the siege tactics uh, to properly work, uh, uh, it was necessary to have uh, uh, much more ammunition than before. Therefore, thousands of bullets uh, in cast iron and in, uh, f in the 15th century, this production was very difficult because there were no suitable steel-making systems or plants. Although the presence of, of a blast furnace in a Florence area would prompt the ammunition production, the prolonged access absence of investment, both public and private in this sector, uh, brought to a stop in the production. This issue had been partially solved thanks to activation of mercantile uh, setting with uh, hundreds of uh, cast iron and wrought iron bullets being made in Lucca and others were bought in, uh, 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 in Brescia. Further bullets had been required in Mantova and Ferrara through the, this, the usual diplomatic system. The import of large amounts of bullets did not eliminate a structural problem. In July 1499, uh, and the siege of Pisa was approaching, the Florentine Signoria had to make uh, some very expensive bronze bolts. And in the next hour, in the next years, the recruitment of skilled workers would be benefiting from a state expenditure starting from the reconversion of a second iron plant in Colle Valdelza and a very important workers from Casentino. A new furnace had been made in Pistoia following the agreement between Dieci di Balia and a company of German artisans as well as Piemonte and Tuscan artisans interested in the profitable business of cast iron bullets and iron weapons. At the beginning of the 16th century, productivity was much better thanks to the, to the use of masters from the Alpine area. This led to a very important uh, profitability in the bl uh, blaster furnaces, and these machines would be used throughout uh, Tuscany with a positive impact on uh, iron civil industry. One of the greatest difficulties uh, by following uh, cast iron work uh, was uh, the supply of mineral minerals used uh, for casting. Uh, also, uh, following the use of tons of old uh, uh, tools. Then the poor availability of raw materials and commodities would negatively affect the fabrication of gunpowder. Salpeter were not made in Tuscany, and of course, they depended on exporting countries not always aligned with the Florentine foreign policy. The general conflict of those years, together with the artillery parks of the peninsula following the French artillery, only made this problem worse. The Florentine officials could only admit that they were lacking this mineral, and they said that these, uh, that, that was very really necessary. Once the monopoly of the Medici Bank was finished about this strategic material, the Dieci di Materia had to count on the initiative of different sellers, even from foreign countries. The most important bargaining was the one by ambassadors in Rome, Milano, Siena, Bologna, Forlì. Since they were full in line and appointed by the state authority, the ambassadors would, again, would bite against the fluctuating market with some price bargaining, transportation timetable, and to get directly with the light powers. But the arsenals of the capital would never accumulate the quantity of the mineral necessary for the army, not even fostering the imports with the customs elimination. In order for this lack of material to be uh, solved, uh, the magistrates uh, tried uh, to uh, use uh, some uh, salpeter artificial plants uh, in Arezzo and uh, uh, Romagna to obtain, at least in the first phase, some rather unsatisfactory results. <laughs> 
The domestic trade had been fostered also to improve the supply of the two other main ingredients of the black powder, which is a sulfur that could be easily found in Volterra volcanic area, and charcoal or coal that was largely used in Montelupo ceramic cluster. Once they came to Florence, these commodities were immediately given to the masters for the fabrication of the explosive, a very important asset for siege war because, as, as the, capital, the captain said, you can, you can hardly do anything without that, and winning or losing depends on, on, on it. And following the introduction of the French cannons, the demand had been increased, had been increasing in the first weeks of extensive use of the new artillery between June and September 1498. 37 tons of gunpowder had been destroyed, multiplying the consumption of the previous six months by 22 times. For the following military operations, the deposits would be used of uh, cities and castles, uh, uh, finishing the reserve of the state. In order for this constant uh, uh, requirement to be met, the Florentine government uh, asked for the or required the construction of new plants in Livorno and Florence. Several unskilled workers, we also have a painter, but many carpenters as well, had been hired to manage the work in the old mechanized plant of the capital city, and these would just deal with the proper weighting of materials and the proper functioning of systems and system. In spite of the high cost of professional labor, in case of extreme necessity, some old especially were uh, asked to be back to work, uh, members of the families that had long been dealing with the preparation of gunpowder. The development of war technology was imp uh, were, were making Dieci di Palia but we are to have a high number of artisans or craftsmen, both in the capital city and in the overall area. The producers of gunpowder, bullets, and cannons together with uh, cut uh, rights aimed at producing the new robust vehicles and brick workers baking and building arsenals and blaster furnaces. This role, another very important role, uh, the Greece, uh, Portuguese, Italian, uh, German, and French uh, artillery experts according to the needs of war, with uh, a lot of money being uh, uh, used by mule drivers. Uh, and because they were conveying the armament from Florence workshops to the battlefield. That's why these, acts, these, would, these, uh, these would represent a very important opportunity for profit or investment together with a very important integration of the uh, normal uh, salary. The active participation to government strategies was benefiting artisans even in terms of social mobility because they were progressively approaching centers of power. The merchant bankers belonging to city aristocracy would take benefit from the need from the necessary cooperation between economic operators and Renaissance estate. With the tax exemption and very important administrative positions for the generous loans and also for the very expensive material resources given to military officials like Salpeter and Tin that was very difficult to find on European markets. Following the quick demand increase in the relative increment in production of gunpowder and bullets, the cooperation between governments and traders would affect more than ever the manufacture of ammunition, an industry that would absorb more than 10 percent of a six-month balance budget of Dieci di Balia. At the end of the 15th century, the state investment on the production of new uh, weapons and uh, commodities would exceed for the first time 
10,000 uh, florins per year, and this would even increase uh, following the indirect financing of the purchase made uh, by uh, the war men uh, of the Republic. But war accounting shows that this expense would not adjust a simple supply for the army, but it would be stimulating the acquisition of innovative technologies, uh, migration of uh, skilled labor, the construction of particular systems, uh, the uh, trading of different products, and the support of important industries uh, together with civil industries. Starting from the beginning of modern age, uh, weapons uh, would, uh, uh, were more and more important as an economic object, although the action of the state would uh, strongly affect the demand, uh, supply and demand of such difficult uh, goods. The passage uh, or, or the switch from uh, Uh, this ammunition by Mercer's companies to a very important polycentric industry coordinated completely by authorities would, inf- would involve a, marked, a more marked political intervention in the strategic sector of public economy. And even in Florence, there was this uh, trend. They uh, were monopolizing the production of artillery through the creation of uh, specialized offices uh, for logistic planning and the creation of a better interface between the production active world and the military system. This uh, complex bureaucratic structure would be dealing with arsenals and uh, bootkeeping, uh, as well as uh, uh, commodities uh, purchase, because there are many, uh, quoting, there are many things uh, and there are many things that we have to do, and the money that would not uh, replace uh, the efficiency of manufacturing uh, system and the involvement of uh, trading actors uh, and uh, the rationalization of the military organization. Even from an economic viewpoint, the introduction of uh, French artillery would mark the end of the old medieval strategy of uh, robbery and improvisation, a triggering process that would be seen in the first years of the 17th century, the so-called military revolution. But that's a different story. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for this very interesting presentation, and also because you respected the time given. You show you now uh, our well-known colleague, professor for economic history at the University of Leipzig, Markus Denzel with whom in the year 2008 we sat nearby here at the same table as presentatori. <laughs> uh, Professor Denzel has written many thorough books about the economic history, uh, also extending his interests to the southeastern uh, European part, uh, something that not everybody does. Mm-hmm. And uh, today, Uh, he will speak about uh, bookkeeping as a key technology of pre-modern commerce, its relevance for the economic development in Europe. Sorry, this one is off. Ah, sorry. I have not looked at Dear Olga, dear colleagues and friends, it is the aim of this contribution to carve out the importance of double-entry bookkeeping, interpreted as useful knowledge for merchants, for the economic development in Europe and its possible indirect influence on economic growth by analyzing examples of lectures as mirrors of their businesses' activities. As a result, it should become clear that the useful knowledge of the technique of double-entry bookkeeping was one of the preconditions of the commercial and later on the industrial expansion of the Europeans, which made a significant difference to other merchant cultures in the world. Therefore, three central questions should be, sorry, should be, uh, 
answered concerning the entrepreneurial risks, the expansion of commerce, and the economic development in Europe. But first of all, a few key steps in the development of bookkeeping in pre-modern Europe are presented to lay the foundation for further argumentation. The main features of bookkeeping and accounting in use today can be traced back to developments that began in the cities of Upper Italy and Tuscany during the commercial revolution of the 12th to 14th centuries. Since the ancient Oriental empires of Mesopotamia, the simple notation of individual business transactions served, on the one hand, as a personal reminder for the merchant, especially when he was involved in money and credit transactions, as well as in long-distant trade. On the other hand, the single entry bookkeeping was also intended to prove the legality of his activities before court. This situation changed with the expansion of trade of the Italian maritime cities. The protection of maritime transport through the novel type of premium-based marine insurance and the efficient processing of payments and credit by the cashless bill of exchange required, in return, a much more elaborate system of bookkeeping than which had previously been usual. At the same time, the once traveling long distance merchants became resident merchants who progressively based their business activities outside their city on agents or factors and established partnerships or trading companies. They were therefore very reliant upon a system of bookkeeping and accounting that is increasingly exact as they were not allowed to lose control over their external transactions which their factors carried abroad since they were answerable about profits and losses to their partners, it is investors. Since the turn of the 14th century, such ledgers were no longer sufficient for some resident merchants in Upper Italy and Tuscany, since the internal order of such ledgers was gradually refined and thus adapted to the expanding business activity. The division of sales into debit and credit began partly with entries in or from separate books, whereby credit appeared to be the most important, most critical, and were therefore often specifically listed. Such rudimentary twofold accounting is called dual entry bookkeeping and regarded as an essential step towards actual double entry bookkeeping, which first came to pass when ledgers and journals yielded information on where exactly the offsetting entry was to be found. Different, separate accounts for specific goods or fields of business appear as yet another significant characteristic of double entry bookkeeping. When there were these uh, individual accounts balanced, in the vast majority of commercial enterprises, this was not a regular action, but rather done on demand, such as when the company was terminated pursuant to contract or in case of inheritance. Yet balances only were compulsory if a ledger was full and a new one had to be opened. Then the balances of each account could be transferred to the new general ledger, which was both laborious and time-consuming. Instead, only the most relevant balances were copied in the new ledger, while the introduction of a profit and loss account at the time of balancing the individual accounts made it possible to close all those accounts that were no longer needed in the new general ledger. Above all, balances were made in preparation of a bilancio de libro, which was a kind of prototype of an actual balance sheet, a trial balance. Once this was achieved, it was only a small step to the general balance sheets, which were prepared comparatively rare since they were labor and cost intensive. It was in Venice in 1494 where the classic treatise on accounting that set the standards for decades was published in printed form by the Franciscan Luca Pacioli. Pacioli's work was not written for his own use, but for the spreading of knowledge, which is aptly to be understood in the sense of useful knowledge, and also achieved a very high degree of dissemination for the time. <laughs> 
Pacioli thus presented the first printed and relatively complete overview of the Venetian bookkeeping system of the late 15th century, which thus became the leading system of the whole of Europe, of the Western Europe. In this way, Pacioli's writings inspired ever new treatises of, on the art of bookkeeping in Italian, English, German, Flemish, and French language from the 1540s onwards. Whereas the theoretical reception of Italian accounting techniques north of the Alps had begun in the 1540s, the publication of treatises on accounting from the 17th century onwards was progressively concentrated in Northwestern Europe. And then in the 18th century, specifically and foremost in England, with a dramatic increase in the number of these writings. The background of this development is, on the one side, the prose of commercialization that began in Northwestern Europe in the late 16th century and culminated in the second commercial revolution at the turn of the 17th and 18th centuries. On the other side, the quest for knowledge and theoretical penetration in the course of the Industrial Enlightenment and the Knowledge Revolution. And lastly, directly related to this, the beginning of the industrialization process in 18th century England. The theoretical preoccupation with double-ended bookkeeping and therefore the production of useful knowledge in this area was concentrated, as it had been in the late Middle Ages, in the economically leading regions of Europe. It is in the first half of the 17th century in the Netherlands, then and notably in the 18th century industrializing England, whereas in the Holy Roman Empire, the number of publications only began to rise in the 1780s with the first steps towards industrialization. Before the industrialization process, fixed assets were insignificant, but with the growth of industry became an important cost of production and distribution. Independent costing is thus often only associated with the industrial production mode, as it now became important how high the costs for a piece of produced goods actually were. But this distinction between factory bookkeeping or costing and traditional commercial or financial accounting is not, however, fundamentally new in the 18th century. Approaches to this can already be found in 14th century Italy and even in England since the late 16th century. In the case of English textile producers in the early 18th century, there were not only more or less regular balance sheets, but also numerous direct costing calculations by the middle of the century at the latest. After the three main questions presented at the beginning of the article, the second step is to analyze whether, and if so, how and to what extent, bookkeeping can be used as a factor of the expansion of commerce, as a medium of the reduction of entrepreneurial risks, and as an instrument of vitalization of economic growth. First. The emergence of ever more elaborate bookkeeping techniques appears not least as a reaction of merchants to the ever greater financial technical challenges of their trading activities, which were to be documented with ever greater arithmetical precision and differentiation in order to be available as a medium of information and memory within the company especially when the principal had no direct insight into the business conduct of a branch a brought due to a geographical distance. However, the action mechanism also worked in the opposite direction. The ever more refined bookkeeping also made possible further expansion of trade in all its facets, both in its scope and in its geographical dimensions, since the inherent control mechanisms offered protection against distant employees and business partners, for example, and significantly reduced the risks of far-reaching long-distance trade with the personal travel activity of the merchant or head of a commercial enterprise. Thereby, 
Commercial activities and its expansion also promoted two monetary aspects. On the one hand, the use of a certain money of account, or later bank money, as a unit of account in the books was a good way to largely exclude inflationary tendencies to which the exchange currencies were subjected. On the other hand, and this seems even more important for a long-term macroeconomic perspective, the dual system of bookkeeping all'italiana already enabled the creation of book money and thus the expansion of the money supply in a continent poor in precious metals. By means of book transfers between personal accounts, payments could be settled funds transferred or bills of exchange cleared without the flow of cash, thus expanding the quantity of book money by a merchant banker providing a business partner with credit on his transaction account. In the long run, book entry or book money gained a much higher share of the total money in circulation for payment purposes than cash. Second, Bookkeeping contributed to reducing entrepreneurial risks. Even simple bookkeeping could not exclude the high risk of maritime trade or credit transactions, but it at least protected the merchant from the danger of being forgotten and possibly from unjustified condemnation in court and could thus grant the enterprise a minimum of security. With the commercial revolution, the arithmetic correctness of the accounting of individual business transactions was added as a further relevant factor for reducing commercial risk. The more arithmetically accurate the bookkeeping was, the lower the risk of disputes among the partners and the more stringent the control mechanisms could be towards trade agents. It is not without reason that Robert Montreux noted for the Fugger bookkeeping that it testifies to the solid economic management of upper middle class merchants who have long since recognized that an exact overview is the best prerequisite for a successful course of business. Thus, the development of commercial records towards double entry bookkeeping can also be interpreted as a process of ever further risk reduction. Because on the one side, the possibility of balancing made it possible to check the accounting accuracy and correct it if necessary. On the other side, the differentiation of the various personal or general ledger accounts offer the opportunity to check the individual branches of business for their earnings. Such ra random checks could not least be seen as a first basis for being able to plan future business activities more stringently than before, when, for example, business branches or partners were no longer taken into account due to insufficient earnings and others with positive earnings were expanded. Finally, the introduction of a profit and loss account, which was actually initially a technical accounting measure, had the positive effect that a merchant could now learn how his business, or at least the respective part of the business, was doing financially, whether he had made a loss or a profit. Whether profit calculations were not as useful for traders in the early modern era as they would be now cannot perhaps be conclusively clarified. But it is undeniable that pro periodic profit calculations had already been made in commercial enterprises since the first half of the 14th century. Why should merchant bankers have made such calculations if they did not want to use it or did not know how to use it? In this way, precise and detailed accounting and a balanced assessment of the individual bookkeeping items made clear decisions possible for the further strategic approach of a business management. Third point. Even if bookkeeping alone did not guarantee entrepreneurial success, it was able to give commercial and later also industrial enterprises a certain inner stability that could certainly promote entrepreneurial success in the long term. 
Particularly and in internal and external crisis situations, accounting could represent the decisive information and planning basis for short-term crisis and long-term resilience management, as it can be regarded as a decisive instrument of entrepreneurial resilience in any way. And this also applies in the reverse perspective. Inadequate bookkeeping and above all a lack of regular accounting was at least one of the main causes of the failure of several upper German trading companies that went bankrupt in the course of the 16th century. And this was already recognized by expert contemporaries. Resilient enterprises, be it in trade or in manufacturing, could in turn form a remarkable support for positive all overall economic development because the term resilience indicates recovery capacity and development on a new basis in the field of economy. From such a perspective, the practice of double entry bookkeeping with all its possibilities of providing and evaluation information can at least be said to have made a positive indirect contribution to positive macroeconomic development. In the broadest sense, growth in the pre-industrial as well as in the industrial era. Especially in the industrial sector, the question of production costs and thus costing has played a decisive role since the 18th century. The contribution of double entry bookkeeping to macroeconomic growth trends can, of course, neither be measured or nor calculated, but rather appears as a soft factor, which, however, should be by no means be neglected. Notably, when it comes to the relevance of the commercial sector for the onset of the industrialization process. Even if double entry bookkeeping is not necessarily to be seen as a precondition of industrialization, it at least secured this process from the business international perspective provided a stable framework for corporate information management and enabled scope for shaping and developing industrial production through costing. To sum up, the aim of this article was to re-emphasize the economic significance of the development of double entry bookkeeping much more strongly than it is currently the case in the mainstream of research, which underscores organizational and cultural aspects while paying little attention to economic components. Without wanting to de derogate these new research results, it should be reiterated that the development of double entry bookkeeping techniques and their spread across large parts of Europe were also accompanied by economic factors and consequences. Double entry bookkeeping has a far greater significance than being a system of organizing business information and a link between medieval and modern business practice. It is an innovative key technology in commercial practice and undoubtedly a useful knowledge for the commercial as well the industrial entrepreneur. The advantages of double entry bookkeeping offered the commercial and later the industrial entrepreneur the chance to check the profitability of his actions, to mitigate his manifold risks and to make his enterprise organizationally resilient. Whether he actually made use of these opportunities is, of course, often not known. When double entry bookkeeping is described here as a key technology of pre-modern commerce, it is almost self-evident that it had a different effect than classical techniques, or inventions or processes. The innovative accounting techniques had more of an indirect and hedging effect on the expansion of trade in Europe and beyond by helping to reduce entrepreneurial risk, at least in part. This is a considerable structural and qualitative difference from, for example, the much documented peddling of caravan trade in the Indo-Asian region, which did not have such accounting mechanisms. Even if it is by no means to be claimed here that a document, a development of double entry bookkeeping techniques was a prerequisite of basis for European expansion, it was nonetheless an instrument that supported 
controlled and safeguarded the developing intercontinental trade. This finding applies equally to the expansion of commercial production in the 18th century and later, which was also supported by bookkeeping and including costed as it were, forming a reliable arithmetical and planning framework in the background of commercial and later industrial development, it ultimately also made an indirect, albeit unquantifiable, contribution to economic growth in Europe, entirely in the sense of the contribution of useful knowledge to economic growth that can be stated in principle. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for this very uh, interesting uh, presentation and uh, for, for having putting so many uh, questions and answers, given answers. So we are coming now to the third, uh, to our third uh, uh, presentation, a common presentation of um, Mans Jansson and Göran Ridden, if I pronounce very good <laughs> your names. Uh, uh, Mans uh, Jansson will speak. Huh? Uh, is a senior lecturer and associate professor at the Department of Hist Economic History at the, the Uppsala University. He is specialized in early modern econom economy, notably in the industrial development and the circulation of the technical know-how. And uh, he is working in a project under the leadership of uh, Professor Göran Rieden, who will participate also during the questions and answers. And the program is, uh, the project is about the Metal Bazaar, knowledge making in the Stockholm metal trades during the long 18th century. You have the floor. Thank you. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to present. Um, I am uh, Mons Jansson, and, and I've written the paper together with Joran Riden, who's sitting down there, and, and um, we're both working at Uppsala University. Um, and the title of our paper is The Economy of Iron and Steel, uh, Material uh, Transformations, Manual Skills, and Technical Improvement in Early Modern Sweden. And this title, we think, pretty well reflects what we have aimed for uh, in writing our paper, because on the one hand, uh, we deal with the concept of, of uh, economia or economy, a concept that was often used during the early modern period to frame an inclusive and more or less static system uh, where the boundaries had been set by God. Economic activities, such as the transformations of nature by human labor, were seen as inextricably linked to the divine creation. On the other hand, we speak about improvement, acknowledging the fact that there were changes, gradual changes going on, in our, in our case related to the working of iron and steel, and the technical solutions applied to facilitate this work. We strive to accentuate the work processes in forges and furnaces, while also emphasizing the ways in which knowledge about work was produced circulated and modified. To use Ursula Klein and Emma Sperry's term, one might speak about the, the trafficking between the, the working of materials and the explanations of these manipulations. The metal trades, and in our case we focus on a period from the late 16th to the early 19th century, is a good starting point for such a discussion. A number of studies have broken new ground in, uh, regarding the ways in which we today perceive improvement in pre-industrial metal working. Sites for metal processing have been highlighted by Pamela Long as important trading zones within the European knowledge economy, places promoting uh, encounters between learned and skilled, uh, new ways of investigating nature and human labor, and the circulation of technical know-how. Other scholars, such as Ursula Klein, has also dug into the individual trajectories of the metal trades to elucidate the practical overlaps of work and knowledge making. 
The story about improvement within the European metal sector is now told more from the point of view of hybrid activities and the making of expertise processes involving, to refer to the images uh, uh, here, both skilled artisans like the Parisian cutler Jean-Jacques Perret, for example, and mobile state officials like the Swedish metallurgist Sven Rienmann. We draw upon recent scholarship to place emphasis on the modified relations between manual skills, nature, technology, and markets, and we do so by focusing on a context that has rarely featured in studies on knowledge making in early modern Europe, as we place activities in the Swedish metal trades at the center of analysis. Sweden a large realm with a strong centralized state apparatus was an important player in the early modern European metal trades. The Board of Mines, or Berries Collegium as it was called in Swedish, was from the mid 17th century charged with supervising the expanding metal working sector with the making of copper and iron leading the way. Growth was largely made possible by the importation, one might say, of skilled workforce and entrepreneurial know-how from the continent. And Sweden also delivered in return. Swedish bar iron, for example, was early on shipped in large quantities to Baltic and Atlantic ports, and from the 1720s it provided uh, a material foundation for the Br uh, British steel industry. In the 18th century, the Swedish state turned an increasing attention to import substitution and the refinement industries. And in the metal trades, large investments were made in, uh, in steel making and fine manufacture. The launching of such projects was often dressed in the language of cameralism, promoting a prosperous economia, stretching down from the divine sphere via the common household of the realm to specific trades and individual households, incorporating state regulation and a division of labor. And when speaking about the, the metal trades and the division of labor, we, we speak about a context here when, when iron and steel making, that's, that's rural-based production, right? Not organized by guilds, so, so just to make that clear. The outreaching and mobile state apparatus produced an enormous amount of written material, most of which are preserved to this day uh, at Swedish archives. And many of these sources, like for example, Reinhold Angerstein's illustrated travelogue from the late 1750s to, to the right, do inform us about movements stretching far beyond the borders of the Swedish realm, pointing to the need of placing material makings and perceptions of work in the midst of European transformations. In our text, we draw upon some parts of this vast material in order to discuss three cases that also, we think, provide a chronology for the modified relations between manual skills, nature, technology, and markets. The expansion for Swedish iron making from the mid 17th century also promoted in rise, a rise in, in other activities like steel making and arms production, finer manufacture. At places like the Vedevorg manufactory in the mining region of Bärislagen, that's in the middle of Sweden, production was geared towards finer wares, something that also made steel making into, pro, into a prior, priority. You need steel to make uh, fine cutting um, implements, uh, cutlery, precision instruments, weapons, etc. During this period, steel could be made through several methods, but there were two techniques dominating the production landscape, the making of crude steel and cementation or blister steel. The former was made through the melting of pig iron in finer reforges and then refined by welding, Blister steel, in contrast, was made through the conversion of bar iron, or wrought iron, in steel furnaces. Crude welded steel was the more common method used at Swedish steelworks during the 17th and early 18th century. And we build on the writings by three individuals, natural philosopher Emanuel Swedenborg, the Walloon entrepreneur Otto Dress, and the supervisor at the Vedevorg manufactory, Lars Harmens to discuss the processes by which pig iron was transformed into steel. These observers agreed on the point that steel making depended on the access to high quality steel ores 
from the Swedish Stahlberg. Learning about steel, learning about its making, this including an intimate knowledge about nature and the possible ways of manipulating it. Intimately connected to this emphasis on nature was the accentuation on manual skills, the manual skills of steel-making artisans. These authors discuss the intricate procedures involved in first melting the pig iron in special hearths, and secondly, the, the welding procedure by which steel bars were bundled together, reheated and drawn out to make the material more solid and even. The latter stage in particular improved during the first decades of the 18th century, and in 1727, Harmans described several different steel sorts, all requiring their specific welding methods. References to brands, specific steel brands like Styrian steel, points to the fact that the production developed through practices of imitation and the circulation of artisanal methods. In the Swedish case, many of the skilled steel makers came from the German lands, such as from Thuringia or Westphalia, for example. At the same time, the steel sector faced problems related to the expensiveness of production. Uh, enormous quantities of charcoal and pig iron were, were required in order to, to produce crude steel. And on top of that, there were the ambiguous qualities of the finished steel as well. And for this reason, Harmans noted, makers of fine steel, uh, fine steel wares at Vierdevog instead prefer, preferred working with blister steel. During the course of the 1720s and 1730s, steel made in cementation furnaces grew in esteem in Sweden. Also in this case, different procedures were applied. The furnace at Vierdevog uh, was operated according a traditional German method fueled with, with charcoal, and, and other steel-making enterprises instead relied on transfers of skills and technology from Britain, where steelmakers relied on the use of mineral coal and, and Swedish bar iron. Again, these projects illustrate the, the impact of technology transfers and, importantly, workforce migration. So, Dress, Harimans, and Swedenborg we're all convinced that to truly benefit from the rich natural resources, Swedish makers needed to improve on their capacity to refine the iron as far as possible. While these three authors were to some extent all familiar with the practical domain uh, of iron and steel, they lacked the practical know-how required to bring about lasting improvements themselves in the realm of everyday work. The ways of making and working steel remain, one might say, hidden in the sphere of craftsmanship to a large extent. But this changed gradually over the following decades. The development that had begun in the 1710s and 20s intensified at mid-century as new markets opened and state investments were made in the domestic manufacturing sector. Swedish officials were, however, well aware of the risk of building this expansion solely on the unpredictable supplies of crude steel. In this context, attention was paid to British steelmaking and the most and the best ways of adapting the British cementation technique to Swedish conditions. This project came to include uh, or occupy two state officials in particular. Sven Riemann and Bengt Quist Andersson. As a state supervisor for course manufacture from, from 1760, Riemann paid close attention to the ways of transforming bar iron by the use of fuels other than charcoal and, and mineral coal, uh, involving himself hands-on in the construction of Swedish cementation furnaces fueled by firewood. Quist's main uh, focus, in turn, was the refinement of blister steel through a, a, a brand new technique, that of making crucible steel. During a study tour in England in 1766 and 67, he had observed that this method being applied in practice, and when returning to Sweden, he initiated the construction of a, a crucible steelworks of his own in Stockholm. We see that to the left here. The work performed by Quist and Rienmann, we believe, signaled something new, as they also involved themselves hands-on in work processes. 
In this sense, their efforts illuminate the shaping of a hybrid expertise in the intersection of science, state making, and craft work. Such practical experiences also made an imprint on their writings. Rienmann published three major publications, including the two volume Encyclopedia Bariverix Lexicon, who we see here at the bottom right. In our text, we focus on his earliest publication from 1772, in which he dealt with the concept of economia and its two major parts, work and nature. The crucial aspect of that relationship was that humans manipulated nature when making goods, but nature always remained more or less the same. The market and the consumption of iron and metal wares were thus tied to a production that was subordinated to God and his creation. Quist followed basically along the same path, and his speech to the Swedish Academy of Sciences from 1776 became kind of a swan song for Swedish cameralism. Neither Quist nor Rienmann imagined any dramatic changes within the sphere of production, and none of them dwelled on technological change. They could not do so, as the concept of technology was first brought into the scientific discourse one year later, after Quist's speech in 1777, when Johann Beckmann published Anleitung zur Technologie. While Rienmann and Quist had entered the world of artisanal work, that is our argument, it became the task of others to add another layer to the understanding of work in nature, placing human makings, within the framework of changing markets and technical progress. The dawn of the 18th century became a watershed for Swedish metalworking. The Napoleonic Wars certainly played a part in this rupture, but an even more penetrating force was the dramatic development in the British metal trades, with coke smelting, puddling, and the use of steam engines, etc. Tony Wrigley has discussed this development as one from an organic economy into the mineral-based energy economy with an advanced organic economy in between. Bengt Quist and Rienmann certainly belonged to the, the advanced organic economy. After Quist's journey in the 1760s, it lasted more than three decades before another sponsored journey to Britain was made by a predecessor of Swedish ironmaking. In 1803, Erik Thomas Svedenstjärna, to the left here, um, visited British metalworking sites. And his descriptions from places like Merthyr Tydfil are the first Swedish ones of a mineral-based energy economy, with coke smelting, puddling, rolling, steam engines. After his return to Sweden, he edited volumes targeting the development of Swedish ironmaking. If, within the capitalist worldview, production and consumption was basically a zero-sum game, Svedenstjärna began to see them as independent. He also made a distinction between the means of production and the practice of labor. In doing so, he focused on technological development with a potential to change society, pushing labor to the background of the analysis. This was complemented by the introduction of a new concept, or, or basically not new, but, but uh, the, the meaning of it was new, that of industry. With Sverenshana, it got a modern connotation of a workshop-based production pointing especially to British iron making. The British path was, however, also possible for Swedish iron masters, and Sverdenstjärna stressed that it was necessary to, and I quote, tirelessly follow the direction of the age. With Sverdenstjärna, news about an industrial revolution of, in iron was brought to Sweden, and a battle cry was launched to solve the deep crisis. Gustav Ekman, uh, a hybrid figure from a later generation, was, one, was the one to definitely lead Swedish ironmaking towards a brighter future, one might say. In 1828, he observed British iron industries, and when returning to Sweden, he set out to emulate what he had seen to reform the makings of Swedish ironworks. Lechefors ironworks, uh, seen here uh, to the top right, became a kind of a testing ground for this new project. 
the method developed by Ekman, referred to as Lancashire forging, incorporated British improvements with new furnaces, hammers, blowing machines, but adapted them to a Swedish charcoal-based production. Still, Ekman was also aware of the importance of skilled workers, noting that one of the causes for the British super super superiority was, and I quote again, the common spread of enlightenment among the working classes, especially the practical sciences. Consequently, the question of artisanal skills did not become redundant, but rather remained an important ingredient in the ambitions to promote further improvements. So, in briefly summing up, what we have tried to achieve uh, here is a story that moves between the skilled working of metals and explanations of these manipulations of nature. A discussion that also integrates a larger context of movements, contacts and changing markets. While the different cases in our paper all illustrate specific interactions, market relations and movements, we believe that they, taken together, point to the modified relations between manual skills, nature, technology and markets in the early modern metal trades. So, thank you. Uh, we thank both of you for this uh, interesting presentation. And now we are coming to our last uh, speaker, who is uh, Dr. Nicholas Amor from uh, the East Anglia uh, an Honorary Research Fellow on the School of History of the University of East Anglia. His uh, subject is the origins of the putting out or domestic system in industrial production in England. Can you hear me at the back? Good. Um, I want to begin by thanking Professor Mark Bailey and Dr. John Lee for their help in preparing my paper and the Foundation for inviting me to present it. Um, ever since Karl Marx wrote about domestic industry in, in Capital, uh, the outworker operating within the putting out or domestic system of industrial production has been seen as a key figure in the transition from feudalism to industrial capitalism. A figure most easily spotted in the uh, wool textile industry from the late medieval period onwards. Uh, the textile industry was also an early exemplar of the division of labor. Outworkers operated at home as carders and spinners to turn wool into yarn, weavers to interlace the yarn on the loom to produce cloth, fullers to wash the cloth to remove the natural oils and give it a thick baize-like finish, dyers to add colour and shearmen to give it a sheen, many of them working under the control of the clothier. Key issues I want to address are changes in population and land use that gave rise to the outworker and the putting out system, the evolution of England's medieval woolen cloth industry, with particular reference to my own county of Suffolk, uh, the nature of the putting out system, the relationship between clothiers and outworkers, and finally the number of clothiers, cloths and cloth workers in England in the late Middle Ages. Now, turning first to population and land use, we know about the population crash caused by the Black Death and subsequent visitations of plague, the decline of serfdom, cash-based tenancies replaced non-commercial service tenancies. That encouraged an engrossment of land holdings, a shift from arable to pastoral use of land, the enclosure 
of land and a polarisation within village communities between larger landholders and smallholding craft workers and labourers. And that in turn created a fear of unemployment. Now these changes were contemporaneous with the growth of the woollen cloth industry. The industry provided employment for smallholding craft workers and labourers who could no longer survive by subsistence agriculture. And this is reflected in two maps of my county uh, that you see here. The map on the left is from the historical Atlas of Suffolk, and the most densely populated parishes are those shown coloured black. Uh, the map on the right is uh, based on my own research, and the parishes with the most recorded clothiers are shown coloured red. There's a remarkable coincidence between black and red parishes, particularly in the southwest quarter of the county. They were attracting workers to the textile industry. Now, while few of these cloth workers became wealthy, uh, until the mid-15th century, many were able to operate independently. Um, this graph uh, records the number of Suffolk craftsmen named in the plea rolls of the Court of Common Pleas in successive 20-year periods. Uh, weavers are in blue, fullers in red, and dyers in green. And the data is, in each case is taken from five plea rolls. You can see there's a steady rise until the mid-1400s as the industry grew, followed by a steady decline. This graph records the number of Suffolk clothiers named in those same plea rolls. And here it shows that the number, as the number of craftsmen declined, the number of clothiers grew. So there was no overall decline in the scale of the woollen cloth industry in Suffolk. But the industry became increasingly focused on export trade, and exports became increasingly channeled through the port of London. Craftsmen were cut off from both suppliers and customers in a way that I explain in my paper. They became dependent on clothiers as link men. They lost their independence, they became outworkers in the putting out system, and as such, they disappear from the plea rolls. Moving on to have a brief look at the nature of the putting out system. Um, operating from home, often using their own equipment, outworkers earned a peace rate in return for their labour, but they had no other fin financial stake in the su success of the business. Clothiers brought each of them in turn the material on which they were to work and then took the product away to, to sell for profit. And they sold much of the cloth to merchants, particularly members of the London Company of Mercers, many of whom were known as merchant adventurers and who dominated the export trade in cloth in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. Uh, this graph from uh, the plea rolls shows the value of that Suffolk trade with the various London companies. Uh, note the prominence of the Mercers in the middle. Now, zooming out from Suffolk to England for the remainder of my talk. In the south and east of the country, many cloth workers became outworkers in the putting out system and a fortunate few were remembered by clothiers with bequests in their wills. Um, here is a table of 16 bequests, not terribly clear, I'm afraid, that I found in 179 clothier wills uh, proven in the prerogative court of Canterbury for the period up to 1530. Only the wealthy proved their wills at Canterbury. Now, it's admittedly a small database of bequests. But what can it tell us? Well, most bequests uh, were modest in amount. There's only one bequest made to comas, which suggests that we're looking at the production of woolens, not worsteds. 
Most requests were made to spinsters, weavers and fullers, who were drawn from wide catchment areas. Few bequests were made to the more highly skilled cloth finishers, uh, dyers and shearmen. So it suggests it was the relatively unskilled work that was put out. Now, moving on to the number of English clothiers, cloths and cloth workers. I want to look at previous estimates, a revised estimate and the growth of the industry between 1475 and 1510 to determine whether outworking engaged only a small proportion of the total national workforce or whether that proportion was sufficiently large to begin changing the economic and social structure of England and moving the country further down the road towards industrial capitalism. This graph shows estimates by various historians of the scale of annual production at various dates of broadcloths or their equivalent. In Essex, Norfolk and Suffolk, uh, a broadcloth should measure 28 yards and 28 inches long, that's 26.3 metres, by seven quarters of a yard wide, that's 1.6 metres, and weigh not less than 38 pounds, 17.2 kilogram. It took about 65 fleeces or a quarter of a sack of wool to make one broadcloth, and one broadcloth was the equivalent of four narrow cloths known as straits. Now there are two main schools of thought. The lower estimates here are made by those historians who have studied the Ulnage accounts, which were prepared by an official known as the Ulnager, who recorded cloth approved for sale. The purpose of the Ulnage was to maintain quality standards, but also to raise revenue for the crown. So evasion was not uncommon, and as the Ulnage was commonly farmed out, in other words, privatised, in return for a fixed fee, the accounts were rarely accurate. And for those reasons, some historians have been wary of using the Ulnage accounts as a source. The higher estimates are made by those historians who assume that in 1500, a million and a quarter adults were buying annually an average of three yards of cloth each. Now, Again, some historians have suggested that three yards of cloth per annum is a somewhat arbitrary measure and perhaps an overestimate. So I want to go back to the Ulnage accounts and compare them with other contemporaneous evidence for cloth production and in particular those plea rolls of the Court of Common Pleas that we looked at earlier, which give us not only the names of clothiers and other cloth workers, but also the value of the transactions that led to their disputes. Common Pleas was not the only forum for the resolution of textile disputes, but as a royal tribunal with a nationwide jurisdiction and a minimum threshold of 40 shillings for claims, it was well matched to the scale of the cloth industry and the long distance of the trade. No direct correlation between the value of litigation, the volume of trade and the scale of the industry, of course, but neither are they entirely divorced. I put these three graphs side by side for comparison. The first on the left illustrates data collected by Professor Herpent Herbert Heaton from the Ornage accounts for the late 1460s and early 1470s. He counted a total of 39,345 broadcloths or equivalent per annum divided up between the counties as shown in the legend at the bottom left. The seven named counties in that legend are those in which the clothier was a key figure in textile production and in which outworks provided most of the labour. Uh, we'll call them the Clothier Counties, and here they are. The second graph in the centre um, illustrates data collected by me from 18 different plea rolls for the period immediately afterwards, 
between 1475 and 1510. Um, I counted 1,470 debt disputes, and here, as you can see, 981 different clothiers. Again, divided up between the counties as shown in the legend at the bottom left. The third graph on the right illustrates data collected by me from those same plea rolls, and I calculated the total value of the clothier debt disputes at £16,575. It's a lot of money in the Middle Ages. Again, divided up as before. The share of the number of clothiers and the value of the clothier debt disputes between the different counties did vary to an extent over time. But this variation is not so dramatic as to make comparison of the three graphs meaningless. So if we compare the ownage graph on the left against the two common pleas graphs, they tell us that the other counties uh, slice, that's in pink, of the ownage pie is much bigger. And that's primarily because much woolen cloth was produced in Yorkshire, but mostly by independent craftsmen and women. Yorkshire clothiers were few and far between. The Essex slice in red and the Kent slice in mauve and the Suffolk slice in orange of the Ornish pie are smaller relative to the West Country slices. The Wiltshire slice, which is in the lighter blue of the Ornish pie, is bigger. And the other West Country slices, as Gloucestershire in green and Somerset in turquoise, appear roughly the same in all three graphs which is perhaps surprising because it's the West Country ornage accounts that have come in for historians' sharpest criticism. These comparisons allow us to say tentatively that Heaton's figure for total national production in Kirk of 1470 at just under 40,000 broadcloths per annum is almost certainly an underestimate. In particular, production in Essex and Kent is seriously understated in the ornage accounts. Determining an appropriate uplift is no easy task, but allowing for omission, evasion and undercounting between 10 and 20,000 additional cloths might be trawled from across England. So an uplift of Heaton's total by between 25 and 50 per cent would not be wholly unreasonable. Even so, it's difficult to conceive that the ultimate total would in 1470 have exceeded 60,000 broadcloths or equivalent per annum. We can use the plea rolls to estimate the growth in the English woolen cloth industry between 1475 and 1510, noting that there was no price inflation over that period. Uh, this graph shows the total value of wool textile litigation in common pleas in Hillary term 1475, that's in blue, and 1510, that's in red. And it includes not only the disputes of clothiers, but also of other cloth workers. So it brings back into the equation counties such as Yorkshire and also Norfolk, which produced worsted. It suggests on the far left that growth across all English counties was about 58 per cent. Um, growth uh, across the seven clothier counties, uh, there in the middle, was about 70 per cent, giving an annualised rate of 1.5 per cent. Growth across the other counties was about 45 per cent, giving an annualised rate of 1 per cent. Growth was stronger in those clothier counties where labour was provided by outworkers in the putting out system of production. But by the standards of pre-modern industry, all these rates were impressive. If total output in Kirk of 1470 was about 60,000 broadcloths, then by 1510 it might have been closer to 100,000, maybe at a stretch even 120,000 somewhere in between the lower and higher estimates that we looked at earlier. The only other reliable source of relevant data for the period are the enrolled customs accounts 
for woolen cloth exports. They tell us that in Kirk of 1470, exports totaled about 40,000 broadcloths, or equivalent, per annum. By the opening decade of the 16th century, this had increased to about 80,000 broadcloths per annum. Uh, Professor Richard Britnell calculated that annualised export growth was about 1.65%, uh, similar to the growth rate in cloth production in those seven clothier counties. And if we adopt the revised production figures that I arrived at earlier, at both times exports accounted for about 80% of cloth production. And even if my output figures are too low, it's difficult to conceive that exports were less than two-thirds of production. English textile industry was heavily geared towards export markets. Finally, how do production figures relate to workforce numbers? Let's return to the Ornage accounts. We have an excellent set for Suffolk for the period 1465 to 69, which I looked at more than 20 years ago. Um, the Ornage was not farmed out in Suffolk at this time, but was entrusted to a Crown servant named William Welpdale. Richard Britnell opined that Welpdale was, quote, an experienced and trusted receiver of royal revenues, and that his accounts, quote, if not a perfect mirror of reality, were at least the fruit of an attempt to make them so. Welpdale counted about 5,000 broadcloths or equivalent in each of these three, four years. And he listed, as you can see, uh, a total of 577 cloth makers. Now, carding and spinning accounted for two-thirds of the labour necessary to make woolens, and that work was invariably done by women who are almost entirely absent from Welpdale's list. So adjusting the figure of 577 to add them, the, the women carders, spinners, and also other cloth workers who did not produce any cloth themselves, such as journeymen and apprentices working in the towns, the total workforce required to produce Suffolk's 5,000 broadcloths per annum might well have been as high as 2,500. Um, that's one person for every two broadcloths. And some historians have postulated an even lower productivity rate than that. If we extend the ratio across the country, then in Kirk of 1470, as many as 30,000 people may have been engaged in cloth making, and by 1510, as many as 50,000, or again, at a pinch, 60,000. But out of a total adult population of about 1.25 million, that's no more than 5%. And as the, the Cambridge population group say that in 1500, about 20% of the population was engaged in the secondary sector, 5% sounds about right. In conclusion, Madam Chairman, if I've got a few minutes left, um, during the late uh, Middle Ages, the, the outworker emerged as a key figure in the wool textile industry of southern and eastern England. Outworkers performed more laborious and lower skilled tasks in their own homes. Exports grew strongly while domestic demand remained weak. So at least two in every three commercially manufactured cloths were sold overseas. This created a hierarchy of merchant, clothier and outworker. To judge by common pleas debt litigation, the industry expanded at an average rate of between 1 and 1.5% 1 1 per annum, depending where you looked in the country, and was strongest in the seven counties where the clothier had become the dominant figure and putting out the main means of production. So total output and the number of cloth workers were not as high as some historians have postulated and involved only a relatively small fraction of the total population. So the, the putting out system did not make late medieval England a capitalist nation. Nevertheless, it transformed 
cloth making in some regions, so must be regarded as a major step forward in the organisation of the industry and one that enabled the country to meet escalating overseas demand um, and move further down the road towards industrial capitalism. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, rich uh, material and presentation. Um, we had a rich session today with uh, force uh, several, uh, on several themes, uh, present, uh, papers, presented by our colleagues who also respected the time. And now uh, please uh, come here and write down your questions. Uh, we have a break of uh, 20 minutes. We are here in, uh, uh, in 20 minutes. <laughs> and then <laughs> I cannot see them. <laughs> and uh, please, we have also the, our students that uh, from the workshop and seminar that could also put uh, questions uh, to our speakers. Thank you. It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, I'm going for coffee. Yeah, you go for coffee. I remain here.
Cominciare? Allora. Um, I think we can start. We are now moving to the second part of the morning session. We have three questions for Dr. Anzani, Mariana Kowaleski. Um, thank you for your very interesting talk. I was struck that you did not say very much about how uh, state intervention may have limited the development of the technological transfer. So even today, the arms industry is one of the most heavily regulated industries. In the Middle Ages, Carolingians were obsessed with making sure that weapons uh, were not coming in and out of the empire. And um, what would be interesting is for you to say a little bit more about, I mean, from your point of view, it was the Florentines copying the French, at least in this one instance. So that's technology transfer. It's hard to believe that the French were happy to have their technology being transferred. Were there efforts at this time to limit the distribution of this, of this useful knowledge uh, for state interests? And, or were there efforts and they just had, they were ineffective? The, the second question is from Patrick Wallis. Thank you. It was a very interesting paper. I think the thing that was most striking listening is the speed with which this technology was adopted, which raised questions for me, at least, about whether or not this is an issue where the barrier, whether actually knowledge really is being necessarily transferred here or simply, oh, that's a clever way to use what we already have. And you identify a lot of barriers to scale more than necessarily barriers to production. I would be interested in hearing about whether that's the case. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you. And uh, I thank you. La ringrazio tanto per... Thank you very much for your presentation. And we can have this kind of debate on war production. You were mentioning uh, the monopoly. Can you elaborate on that? And the Medici Bank, Lorenzo, in this sector. Funziona? Sì. Risponderò in italiano. Allora, per quanto riguarda uh, la regolamentazione as for industry regulation, yes, I didn't deal with that in my paper. I did so in other publications that I made. We know that arm weapon is limited. Therefore, salpite, as we said, is limited to something that has to be mediated among states therefore also through diplomatic channels. Uh, and there have been many requests to the Duke of Milano, both for exporting products, uh, weapons, therefore armors uh, and whatever, and also for migration, uh, the migration of uh, such uh, experts, uh, of the experts are making uh, the weapons. And then we have uh, exporting licenses for war horses, for sulfur, which is another component of the gunpowder. Therefore, to some extent, we see that this industry is strongly limited. It is a difficult uh, good, uh, goods. However, as for artillery, we see that this works slightly differently because we can see that uh, there is uh, some more fluid and larger circulation of experts uh, producing or making these uh, weapons. Uh, these experts can be very much uh, focused uh, on this kind of production, uh, therefore artillery masters. But then we have uh, experts uh, that are not uh, really uh, that they are they are not. Uh, uh, for example, we have sculptures, bronze sculptures, like Bronzo Ghiberti, one of them. We have a lot of data from a Ghiberti workshop. 
which is an artistic bronze sculpture workshop, and then we have Calderai Padellai. I mean, there is something slightly different for these artillery masters, and we see that they do not belong to guilds. They, uh, they take some distance from this institutional uh, system. Therefore, from this viewpoint, uh, we have no such stringent regulation. And the weapons themselves uh, circulate among states. We have a lot of requests uh, for uh, loans of cannons and bombards. Uh, so we have the chance of uh, of having this peaceful uh, system. There is no industrial uh, secret. And this is, is very, very interesting, uh, considering uh, the contemporary situation of uh, spionage vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the imitation of uh, weapons uh, that become more and more sophisticated. And this also brings me to the French, to the question of the French. And this will be seen in 1499 with the alliance between, Venice, between France and Venice. We see that the French are urging the Venetians in order for them to adopt their technology. They say less Italian style bombers, but many more French style cannons, showing the intention of diffusing or disseminating this technology among allies. But it is also clear that the quick circulation of weapons is fostering also those not being allied. For example, in Naples, we have uh, in Naples uh, the victim of the French in this period. Uh, Naples is taking over this technology through the imitation of manufacturers themselves. Therefore, it's not uh, so much uh, a diplomatic element or a peaceful technology circulation, but rather the direct imitation. It is the Florentines asking the French uh, and the King of France uh, through their ambassadors, asking for artillery masters, uh, melters, which they obtain. Therefore, there is no strong resistance against technology change and the circulation of weapons. It sounds strange, but actually, there is no such uh, commitment to keep this technology secret or confidential. Beyond uh, some uh, elements, uh, this technology can be replicated rather easily or duplicated rather easily. If you know this uh, craft, uh, uh, bell casting or other bronze object, uh, I think that you can easily imagine, uh, also through some trial and error, and the so-called unuseful knowledge, you can actually uh, produce such uh, weapons. As for the other question about the quick diffusion of this technology, we see that uh, actually there is uh, some previous experience. Uh, unlike uh, what was believed uh, in uh, by historiography, we see that some testing on uh, some uh, technology, uh, technological uh, innovations uh, starting from the 70s. So when the French come, uh, for example, Guicciardini or some chronicles, including Francesco Materazzo that I mentioned in the presentation, uh, they do not realize that uh, some of these artifacts had already been adopted uh, in Italy. The two-wheel carts, uh, Orecchioni as well, they have been adopted already. And some of the forms of the French weapons have been adopted already. But what really was an hindrance to this technology in the 70s and 80s is the lack of some kinds of raw materials like salpite, the scarcity, or the lack of blaster furnaces for producing cast iron bullets. But what can be seen starting from 1494 is the strong political commitment to imitate such weapons which are seen as much more efficient than the old bombards. So with this, when there is a strong political commitment, there is the will to imitate. But it's not just imitating the weapon. You need to imitate all the systems. It is dealt with, therefore, bullet production and card production. But it is very difficult to do so in Italy. There is some early imitation of the weapon, but a full development of the productive system in order uh, 
for it to work properly, which will only be seen in the first years of the 16th century. As for the other question, Banco Medici or Medici Bank, Lorenzo de Medici is very, was very, very much interested, starting from the 80s, in both in the search and the supply of strategic materials. So we have a direct interest by Medici Bank, both for saltpeter supply as well as a sulfur supply, as well as uh, copper and the production of armors. Uh, Lorenzo and his son Piero are trying to uh, to have uh, some uh, weapon making uh, uh, plant in Pisa. Salpeter is uh, the most peculiar case, uh, and in, Lorenzo is very much interested, both from a commercial viewpoint as the owner of the bank, uh, as well as uh, the head of the Florentine state. Uh, therefore, we see two. We we have two channels: the commercial or uh, as well as diplomatic channel, providing the different uh, exporting licenses. Uh, therefore, some attempts have been made uh, with the King of Sicily, with the Pope, especially after the creation of uh, these uh, the becoming uh, rel uh, relatives with the Pope. Therefore, we have a rather strange link between the public and the private sphere. We have Lorenzo try to obtain strategic materials, which is used for incrementing uh, the, the finance of the bank and to exploit its resources with this information network. But we also see that uh, this objective is especially addressed to consolidating the new Florentine military machine with new uh, military uh, courts, uh, some uh, strong uh, defense uh, system uh, with the creation of, of, of uh, castles. Therefore, we see that uh, Medici polit policy in the military field is very rational, stringent, uh, and effective, uh, of course, if compared with the objectives uh, and ambitions of the Florentine state, uh, which is not like uh, a super Italian uh, uh, power. We have a question from Professor Sabatini. He wrote. Uh, he wrote. Uh, he wrote uh, the the question. Professor Sabatini, please. Thank you. I would like to say something. I have a few questions for you, Fabrizio. I think that Fabrizio Anzani already replied, but I would like uh, him to add something. Uh, maybe something. Some some words on how. Your research becomes part of a historiography that you were mentioning. Some peculiar innovative stance. And the other sentence I would like to hear deals with the sources. And what about sources? It is a very interesting presentation. We should try to understand where all this information comes from. Thank you. From the innovation viewpoint, uh, innovation is there. Maybe it is not that effective, at least at the beginning, uh, but it is something which uh, develops throughout the years. And from the war viewpoint, uh, it uh, spills over to other economic sectors. Uh, this is my own perspective uh, of going back, of seeing weapons not just in an independent uh, sphere. But I think that weapons uh, should be part of an economic uh, uh, sphere, because uh, they are difficult objects uh, to some extent. But we see that they can also be part uh, they can be part of uh, the innovation procedure, labor transfer, and incentives to both trade and production. To some extent, my position vis-a-vis -vis this topic is this one. As I said before, we, have, uh, we speak of useful knowledge, but I think that it is especially it is also the unuseful knowledge, this continuous testing and the, the mistakes being made allowing uh, the acquisition of uh, such knowledge. As uh, for sources, uh, 
and this is the question for this is my question for Professor Denzel. We have uh, such a complexity of uh, sources uh, that are very similar as a military accounting. Uh, and then we have the mercantile accounting or bookkeeping uh, for Dieci di Balia starting for 1495. Therefore, after the fall of the Medici regime, we have this bookkeeping organized following the, mercant the typical Florentine mercantile model. We have a ledger, uh, entry, and expenses. We have a journal. We have a set of uh, uh, accounting books uh, coming from some uh, some merchants like Strozzi, as well as subordinates. He's a subordinate. My question for Professor Denzel, I hope he will reply. Do you think that this development of accounting, do you think it was useful for the development, important from an economic and entrepreneurial viewpoint, but also as a resource for the growth of the modern state? I'd like to explain myself better. I think that there is not so much the commitment of reducing the entrepreneurial risk, but rather the intention was controlling accounts and to avoid any uh, to avoid mistakes. There is the, the control is especially on the expense, on the revenues, and then. This is the way we see change in a bookkeeping. We can also say that the multiplication of tax and publication on bookkeeping, this also may come from the need for the state to find more bureaucrats and accountants in order for state finance to be made. Thank you. We have another question, two other, three other questions for Professor Denzel. Uh, Geran Rieden. Um, just uh, perhaps a bit unfair because I'm going to talk about something that you didn't talk about, uh, but I, I, I think it's relevant uh, in in because there, there are a few papers on, on on bookkeeping and accounting, and I really like your paper and and the way that that you kind of uh, attached. Uh, bookkeeping to to the commercial revolution, but I would I would also ask you. I mean, bookkeeping was also not only used in commercial transactions, but it also became used in 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 estate and estate management. And, and there is a there is a couple of books on on accounting in in the plantation uh, environment. I mean, Justin Roberts uh, on on enlightenment. Uh, plantation economy and stuff like that and I'm, I'm doing similar research myself when when I, I use accounts as a way of controlling labor and, and you you got account books that really really stress that the very aim of accounting is to keep track on labor so the kind of so the kind of production aspect is also an important aspect in that so so I uh, I would like to hear you kind of expanding on, 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 on that in relation to what you say about commercial accounting. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, another question from Victor Perez Sanchez. Hi, yeah, I'm Victor Perez Sanchez, PhD student at LSE. Uh, my question is, an easy question because it's the elephant in the room, but you don't talk about the Iberian case. Why the Iberian case? Why doesn't bookkeeping, uh, I mean, double entry bookkeeping happen in the, in the, in the Iberian case? Uh, look at the treatises, there's uh, almost no evidence on that. And also the point, I'd like to connect this with, uh, with also another point you don't talk, that is the, um, the American silver. Um, and um, in connection with, uh, I mean, is this double entry bookkeeping a way to solve the problem of liquidity of this hard currency? So Iberia doesn't have this, didn't have this problem, and therefore uh, didn't need to use this double entry bookkeeping. I mean, how do you explain the Iberian case? That's the question. Thank you. 
And we have another question, but the name of the, the man, the woman that asked is not written. It is written University of Lipsia. <laughs> Who has? OK, <laughs> please come. <laughs> I'm not from Lipsia. I'm Marco from Pisa. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> no way. I'm a PhD student from Pisa. And my question is, has to do with a comparison with earlier periods. So I'm thinking about ancient attempts in bookkeeping. Okay, because, of course, we have most of the, the, the evidence is from public realms, like Athens. And, but focusing on private accounts, I think the question kind of relates to yours, uh, Goran, because it's, um, it, we have, there, there is some evidence about estate management and bookkeeping in state, estate management in, uh, in uh, Egypt with papyrological evidence. Uh, Rathbone has, has studied it. And he, his book was, his claim was that this, um, these attempts were actually done to, in a way to rationally manage this estate in terms of labor, but also in terms of profitability. So um, my question is about what was the key difference then that differed from these attempts to later more commercially oriented attempts in bookkeeping that you observe and that are so relevant for economic growth as, as you claim. Thank you. So you can answer and then I make the remark. The microphone, please. Okay. Thank you very much for all these very interesting questions. It was not possible to include all these topics in my paper. And I have to say, first of all, that I'm working especially on commercial accounting. This was the first point. The second point, and I will begin, of course, in the ancient time. Um, the function of bookkeeping from the ancient time up to now is quite the same. Controlling, OK, and thinking about strategies. But the difference between the ancient time and my time from the late Middle Ages up to 1800 is that we have in the ancient time only single entry bookkeepings. Relative, yes, let me say in quotes, primitive bookkeeping. We have notification, we have memorial, but we have no functioning of bookkeeping with uh, profit and loss account. And this is the most important difference between the old world, world up to the commercial revolution and the world before. But the function for the state is quite the same. And so I came to uh, Goran's uh, question. Um, of course, uh, bookkeeping is very important for controlling labor, but not only in the plantation economy, but uh, uh, as well in my field, because the, uh, uh, the principal, the head of the company, has also to control his factors, his agents, is also uh, a controlling of labor what they did for the company. This is quite the same. So I th see not such, uh, such a, a difference. And if we can uh, um, bring this uh, on, on the level of the state, I think it's the same as well. And we can say the, the state management was, yeah, uh, became much better as uh, the first cities, especially in Italy, the first was Genoa, um, and later on uh, the cities of Augsburg and Nuremberg and something else, um, introduced forms, different forms of bookkeeping 
to control their finances. And this became the model for the states in the mercantilism uh, of, um, may, might be uh, Prussia or Austria or something like that, doesn't matter. Um, the principles are always the same, but the double entry bookkeeping was introduced in, uh, in state funds, but not introduced in state funds, yes, in some states up to now. Yeah? In Germany, we have now, in, in, in the public finance, a process from going from cameral to double uh, entry bookkeeping. Now, yes, the 21st century. It took a, a, a very long time. And to your question, I say yes, uh, bookkeeping produced useful knowledge useful for the economy. And I think also it was very important for the growth of a modern state because um, from this position of controlling state finance, since the mercantilism at the latest, um, it's not necessary to have a double entry system. You can have a, a, a single entry system uh, quite primitive system, but you have a control about what is coming in and what is going out. And this is very important in the 19th century, especially in Germany, to control the princes uh, and their reign by uh, the, the, the parliaments the, the, uh, becoming um, a, a power in the state. So I think it is useful knowledge and important knowledge for the development uh, to a modern state. The Iberian case, of course. Um, it was a, a clear decision because there are so many uh, scholars here um, much better informed about Iberian bookkeeping than I uh, can be, yes? Uh, and so I said, no, it's uh, not uh, the theme here. But uh, in principle, the Iberian case is quite the same as the Italian or the, uh, the Southern French uh, systems, uh, not a, a speciality, um, and uh, therefore uh, I included it in my general overview, yes? And I beg your pardon that I don't have, as well in my written paper, no um, uh, examples from the Iberian Peninsula, but that uh, this can be done in uh, some weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to add something uh, to your very rich presentation we have spoken about privately. Um, there are many uh, titles published of, uh, in Greek from the years 1598 until uh, uh, 1820, uh, more than uh, 20 titles with republishing, republished books, published in Venice, in Vienna, from uh, Greek and Venetian and Viennese, Austrian um, publish, uh, publishing houses, uh, about uh, with practical and theoretical information about the commercial calculation, the bookkeeping, the so-called scrittura doppia, mm -hmm. Uh, etc. And these books have been used all over the southeastern market, European markets because the Greek language was uh, the lingua franca of that time uh, among the commercial, uh, the com the commer commercial men, etc. And also in the Greek Orthodox uh, diaspora in the Italian peninsula, in uh, Habsburg monarchy, and also in uh, Russian areas. So uh, this is only uh, an addition. <laughs>
And may I make an addition as well, only two sentences. Together with my colleague Heinrich Lang and our colleague Werner Skeltens from the Bamberg University, we are planning a project for a new history of bookkeeping, but not only for the western part, the western hemisphere of Europe, but also for the eastern. So I'm very thankful to Olga that uh, she uh, uh, gave me uh, this uh, information about the Greek publications. And if you have any information from your uh, uh, research for such a project, I would be, we would be very thankful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now the questions for uh, Professor Janssen and uh, Fabrizio Arzani and Martin Brack and from the internet Tanya Skambrax. No, it is uh, the first is uh, prof, uh, Dr. Arsani. No, no problem. Okay, no problem you, can, you can make the question and then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The order. Uh, so thank you for a, a wonderful and I uh, want to say very rich paper. Um, while reading it, I was under the impression that you are talking about an industry that is slightly different from the sort of industries that Patrick and myself were discussing in our paper. And I would like to sort of clarify what is going on as I understand it and then ask you uh, whether uh, I was right about this. So what you seem to be describing are uh, dedicated efforts on behalf of the industry to collect information from abroad about new technology being developed, especially in Britain. So one could interpret this, I suppose, in two ways. One is, this is an example of mercantilism. The state is sending out industrial uh, spies to other countries to improve its own domestic industry. Or, as an example of a an industry that has already experienced an increase in scale and therefore is able to dedicate uh, resources to this sort of um, technological development. And if this is true, I was wondering also, so this is my second question, I suppose, whether the word artisan or artisanal is still appropriate for this industry, whether or perhaps we are looking at an industry with large fixed costs and an industrial labor force rather than an artisanal workforce. Thank, Thank you. Just una domanda velocissima. A quick question. In the sources, the Swedish sources, did you have any conflict between the Crown, enterprises and community vis-a-vis -vis the exploitation of environmental resources? Uh, the colleague was mentioning, for example, charcoal, uh, and therefore I was wondering whether there is any conflict vis-a-vis uh, -vis wood cutting or tree cutting, the cutting of the trees, uh, and which uh, is typical in the Tuscany of the 16th century. I find it a very, it was a very interesting, fascinating paper. And um, I'm always fascinated by the broad, comprehensive character of uh, cameralist literature. And I would like to ask you a bit more about the argumentation techniques in those uh, sources. Um, coming from the Middle Ages, um, there's like the narrative and um, framework and the justification for innovations in the in medieval texts, for instance, is very often the common good, bonum comune. And I would like to, uh, yeah, to ask you if you might, um, if you may be uh, able to elaborate a bit on this. Is this ideal still somehow linked to the subject of industry and innovation and enterprise, or does 
do we can we see that somehow like moral values and norms um, as justification for the introduction of uh, in industrial innovation has gone lost. So um, is this idea of the common good, does it still play a role? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, you can answer. Well, should we, is it on? Yeah. Shall we begin with the first question then? And, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I can perhaps start with with the the um, uh, Martin's question about the the differences w with regard to 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 the industries we're we're talking about. And and uh, of course there are, uh, as I said, uh, iron and steel making is a rural based production, not organised as as guilds, although we have certain certain hierarchies uh, with with masters and 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 um, uh, trainees for example at the ironworks so so it's a guild like structure but not organized as guilds uh, then then iron and steel making are an example of of quite a large scale production but but still organized in a traditional uh, i mean artisanal way um, based on manual methods, etc. Uh, it must also be said then that, that all metal working isn't taking place at rural-based ironworks and steelworks, but also in the towns uh, in Sweden, for example, where we have guilds. So, so uh, it's, it's really sort of a division of activities, uh, state-organized and, and guild-organized, etc. As regards the the second uh, part of of the question, whether this is an example of mercantilism, espionage, uh, and um, or, or whether it is an example of, of an increase in skill, and and, and uh, I mean, I think you can say that that what we really try to focus on is the sort of complex situation where we have both technology transfer and industrial espionage, if you want to, to phrase it like that, and an and, uh, example of, of the sort of non-organized migration of, of workforce between ironworks and, and between Sweden and, and other parts of Europe as well. So, so it's really a more complex situation than only, uh, I mean, than to, than to only speak about technology transfer. Uh, I, I, if I remember right, Paolo Bertucci is speaking about intelligent traveling, uh, which I perhaps think is a better concept, really, than to, to sort of frame the openness, secrecy, the different types of, of mobility uh, that we try to, to put in focus. Do you want to add? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, I myself have talked about them as travelers in trade instead of, of industrial espionage. Uh, with, with the concept of trade as, as, as a much wider concept than, than uh, production, because trade is kind of inclusive and, and encompassing uh, different aspects and, and commercial aspects and productive aspects. So, so I, I think that is uh, important to, to say that these early travelers they were interested in more than just the kind of artifacts. Uh, uh, but, but also, then, and, and to your question, but if, if you're right that we, we, we deal with different kinds of, of industries, yeah, we do. Uh, but there is still uh, an important common trait because the thing we try to do, and this is the first time we, we actually try to, to take a very long perspective. We, we've written mainly about bits of the 18th century before, and now we try to, to talk about 150 years. So, so, but in that development, which is a similar development uh, compared to, to the guild structure that, that, that you deal with and our kind of non-guild, is that we go from an artisanal uh, artisanally based uh, production organization to a more industrial uh, organization and I think that is that is something that we share and and perhaps we end up with the, with the kind of meeting point somewhere in in uh, 
say, 1834 or something like that. Uh, so, so, so that is that is interesting, and and I also, I mean, we like to use the word cameralism instead of, of, of mercantilism, and I think I think cameralism is 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 a slightly better term because it kind of encapsulates a more powerful state, and and when the state is more present, and and uh, that is also something that's kind of withered away, and 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 towards the end of the 18th century, you you. Could perhaps, uh, yeah, Mons used the word swan song of, of Swedish cameralism, which I think is is, is an appropriate uh, way of of of, of, of tackling uh, tackling that. So so we are talking about different things, but uh, I, I think we we can join uh, forces in 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 the development. Yeah, should, should we continue with the second question? Yes, then? Uh, the, as regards the conflicts between the. The, the crown or the state and the local users of, of natural resources, as I understood it. Uh, there are uh, conflicts throughout this period we, we study, uh, especially with regards to the use of, of, of charcoal, which is a, a, a very demanding resource in terms of, I mean, you have to use a lot of, a lot of wood. Uh, so, so there are regulations for, for the usage of, of, of wood uh, uh, steered towards the um, the um, uh, the ironworks and the steelworks, uh, so so pretty much adapted to the iron industry. Uh, yeah, do you want to? No, I mean, I, basically, that is is a gigantic field, and mm. and uh, when it comes to to charcoal, for instance, that is that is a. I mean, we could we could spend the afternoon talking about that, <laughs> and and because we, I mean, I have done for many many years research about about that as well. So so we, if you if you like, we can talk about it later. And and, uh, and for for the uh, the last question, uh, which I found very interesting um, about uh, the the argumentation about techniques in in cameralist sources, the idea of a common good. I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, discussion that we perhaps <coughs> need to elaborate a little bit more on, because there are in whether we deal with cameralist textbooks or, or state reports, the idea. That that innovation should not only benefit the innovator, of course, but 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 also the the sort of larger context of householding or economia, uh, and and in in that sense, we we really talk about innovation as uh, a common good or or a common sort of useful resource. Uh, uh. I think so. So so that that's a very good comment, and I, I think that. Uh, throughout the 18th century, that that is very, that's a very, um, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's there in our sources. So, yeah. I mean, I mean to to add just a bit to that. I mean, uh, it's it's Sweden is a fantastic country to deal with these things, and 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 cameralists. Uh, the cameralist state is, is brilliant for historians. I mean, the, the cameralism is made for us in, in, in a way because it, it has created such an, uh, an enormous amount of, 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 of sources. And, and uh, so, so in that sense, we, we are actually thriving on, on cameralism while, while uh, dealing with cameralism as well. So, and, and, but, the, but the idea is that it is a common good and the overarching ambition of the state is actually that these iron masters produce iron and steel. They could thrive, but they should also supply uh, or support the state. So you do have the, the kind of layering of, of, of uh, economy or householding that, that goes from, from below up. But at the same time, the overarching ambition of the state is actually to make things that happen here actually available there as well. So, so uh, Cameron is fantastic for historians. Thank you very much. And now we're coming to the last paper questions. And there are many. Uh, so I would like to ask the, um, our colleagues that put the question to be brief, 
and also the answer in the same month. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we have the, a question uh, from Professor Renzo Sabatini, if he likes to put it now or later. Yes, okay. I really thought, I really thought of this point. I appreciated this presentation and the research carried out on the possible sources. That's really fantastic, paving the way to brilliant results, brilliant results achieved in your research. But I want to raise one point, which you make an observation of bi bibliography, if possible, bibliography on the topics shown according to the title, Putting Out System, Domestic System, Bibliography. There's a start of an industrial production. So in the 70s, 80s, and 90s of the past century, this might be like prehistory, but there has been a huge debate, a national debate with the title of uh, industrialization before industrialization. I remember, just to speak, a full set of workshops, seminars organized by Professor Carlo Poni, and I remember him with a great deal of affection. I remember this professor because he was very, very sensitive from the historical viewpoint. I remember one year, 1983-84, at the European Institute in Fiesla, he organized a full set of seminars with the most outstanding scholars of that period, telling very interesting uh, things, uh, a sort of interpretation grid. And in those workshops, uh, we dealt with several topics, uh, strengths and weaknesses of these uh, proposal, even for the historical intelligent intelligence, we also got some weaknesses and some doubts, critical points. Uh, what the interpretation agreed was supposed to be valid for all situations, for all uh, seasons for all European regions, this sort of a kind of interpretation grid. So I scientifically grew up this way with these thoughts. And also I keep treasure of the critical points of this theory, proto-industry of that model. But uh, I was uh, I was a bit astonished because in the essay by Nicholas uh, Amo, we have no eco, no criticism, maybe, of this debate, of these historiographical debates. So that's a footnote. Thank you. And now Fabrizio Ansani. I want to know if if in the English sources. Uh, do you have any other news of the possible use of the putting out system outside the textile world? Do you have some applications to share in addition to uh, a cloth making? One case not very well known is the one of the industry of arrows. I found it in Florence. So the state becomes an entrepreneur, does uh, giving some people, also women, but also musical instrument makers, uh, artisans, uh, chosen at random, not very much experience in wood uh, uh, carving. So the state is giving these people a full set of individual products, uh, so rods, uh, feathers of the arrows, uh, and these people, these workers, uh, are asked uh, to, to start the domestic production of these hundreds and hundreds of arrows. Do you have anything similar in the UK at the beginning of the 15th century? Do you have any similar in the UK at the beginning of the 15th century? Philip Schofield? Uh, 
Thank you very much, Nick, uh, for a very interesting um, paper. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure I'm convinced by my own question, so I'll, uh, but, but uh, I, I noticed when the, um, the common police litigation, for example, was increasing with clothiers, but I was also wondering about the per capita increase in terms of those clothiers, and it made me then think about your very interesting demographic data on those involved in the cloth production activities generally. And so I wondered then about whether there's an inverse relationship possibly between growth and numbers involved in a sense which might also feed into a sort of skills relation. So effectively, the more people you have involved in that, is, is it actually less efficient and actually declining in, in a strange sort of paradoxical way? Thank you. Marianne. Thank you, Nick. I have uh, two short questions. The first is a methodological question about you know, the construction of your CP40 sample. Am I right that really the way that you identified what was a clothing debt or clothier is through the uh, defendant's occupation? So, of course, that might have some bias built into it, and I think that is something that you should acknowledge and talk about where that bias might come up and what you're missing uh, by focusing just on the defendant's occupations, and that's the only way. And then if you're, when you're calculating the value, is the only way you can identify clothing debts through the defendant's occupation? If that's the case, then that, uh, to me, is also a pro I mean, I, I think it's a fabulous exercise. It's a great proxy, but I still think that you should acknowledge what some of the problems might be. Uh, my question, uh, and you don't have to answer me on that, but my question is to go back to the title of your paper on the origins. So when I saw the word origins, I naturally thought chronological origins, and as somebody who's worked a lot in Devon, and Somerset, I'm thinking, well, he's going to be talking about the 14th century, because I've certainly found evidence of the putting out system in the clothing industry in CP40s, amongst other sources, uh, in late 14th century Exeter, in which uh, merchants, I don't know if I, I've, some of whom are clothiers, they're certainly exporting cloth, have all sorts of debts with weavers and fullers and even some dyers, most of whom are in rural locations. They are not always using the plea of the debt plea. They're using plea of account. Thank you. And now Patrick Wallace. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, when we think about one of your questions is a question of scale. Ultimately, this is about scale as you presented it. You discuss it always at a national level, though. Yet if we, think of, if we look regionally, the scale of what you're describing might still be very large in terms of the county or the parish or the sub-district. And I wonder whether that might be a better way to think about the implications of the intensification of putting out for capitalism. Just in the same way when we think about the Great Divergence, we stop thinking about China, we think about the Yangtze. Maybe we stop thinking about England and we think about Suffolk. Uh, Professor Richard Ankler. Let me go, ask you to go a little beyond and more, more generally. Uh, f first of all, uh, a minor point perhaps, uh, gender. You note that a number of women are involved in the trade, and I wonder if uh, household might be a better unit than population. I wonder if you, this, this is also a difficult number to come up with, but I wonder if it would change the results in any form. The other is a more general question about the putting out system and what it does to technology transfer. We've made the argument, many of us, that if you put a group of artisans together, especially in a guild, for example, there's going to be uh, exchange of information um, and productive competition. But everybody's spread out uh, in the putting out system, except uh, in London, the finishing trades. So first of all, do you think that there's more, uh, more signs of technological uh, change 
in the finishing trades where everybody's together than in, say, weaving in the, uh, in the countryside. But the other thing is, are these clothiers, in fact, do they become controllers of technological transfer? Do they decide, rather than having individuals or the market decide, what's going to be produced? In the, in the case of worsteds, for example. Uh, Vincent Ostermeyer. Thank you. Uh, I'm Vincent, and I'm from Lund University, also a PhD student. So thanks for all the presentations. And um, my question relates sort of if you can expand a bit on the decline of uh, this, this system, or vice versa, the rise of the factory system. So within the factory system, I know there's a debate on whether factory production um, sort of became dominant because of division of labor or whether there was like a new application of technology required uh, that replaced the, the putting out system. And it would be nice to see uh, sort of your stance in this debate and how your case of Suffolk fits into that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the last is Salvatore Giriacono. Yes, I think that my question is on the line on the, the last two questions of Richard Anger and Ostermeyer. It is about the technology. What was the role of the technology creating jobless people? So how important was the introduction of technology to create or increase the litigation? So that is already the question set by Richard and Ostermeyer. But I can join another question. How different is the Suffolk region in comparison with other English region? Because we know the, the answer was different in different locations of, of Great Britain. And again, as Sabatini underlined, you didn't quote any book about uh, protein industrialization, or for instance, uh, Franklin Mendes uh, or Crit uh, Schlumbo and so on. So uh, the, the debate was really based uh, on this problem. Uh, and uh, you know, some, uh, also some economic historians uh, here didn't accept the idea of uh, protein industrialization. Uh, I remember Mark Kellenbein, he told me, why, why, when do we finish to talk about protein industrialization? Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, you can. Yes. Right. Good. Right. Let me go through those, hopefully, um, briefly. Um, pro proto industry. Um, no, I, I didn't discuss proto-industry in, in this paper. Um, I did discuss it in a, a book that I wrote in 2016 um, called The Triumph of the Suffolk Clothier. Um, I think there's one copy left, so um, if anyone wants to, uh, to buy it and, um, and, and read what I had to say, that's, um, that's the place to find it. Um, the, the irony um, about proto-industry is that the, from, from my research, uh, those regions that were most heavily invested in uh, the putting out system were not the areas where industrialization later took place. So there's a geographical divorce between the two. And I think that was one of the weaknesses in the proto-industrial argument, uh, as I recall. Um, putting out system outside of the textile industry? Um, I think um, the, the short answer is that I, I don't know. Um, I, I haven't looked sufficiently closely at other industries. I did write a book about Ipswich in which I looked at the leather and the, um, the metal industries and saw no sign of putting out, but that was in a town, so perhaps I shouldn't expect to. Um, I, I suspect that textiles were peculiarly a, um, open to, to putting out, first of all, because of the scale of the industry, 
um, and secondly because of the division of labour, the very early division of labour and the separate skills that um, were, were developed by, by various artisans. But yeah, it's quite possible that um, one could find examples of putting out um, in, in other industries. Um, Philip's question about the, the inverse relationship between um, uh, more, 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 more people and um, le less uh, productivity. That's the sort of the story of the UK over the last sort of 20 years, isn't it, Philip? Um, the, again, the answer is I, I, I don't know. Um, what one can say is that, um, and I don't know whether this is relevant, but the, the average debt incurred by the, the clothiers or, um, is, is generally larger than the average debt incurred by um, weavers, fullers and dyers when they're operating independently. So I think if you, if you scale up the numbers into debt litigation, debt, debt values, clothes are even more um, important than the, um, the previous generation of independent operators. Um, Marianne's questions about methodology. Uh, she's absolutely right. Um, you, you almost always get uh, a, an occupational labor, label for the defendant. Um, you don't always get an occupational label for the, the plaintiff or the claimant. Um, although if, if the claimant is, is a London merchant, um, then that's more likely to appear. Uh, I, I, I recognize that bias and I do actually mention it in my paper. Um, and I guess you could go through painstakingly through the plea rolls looking for names in the plaintiff column that are described as defendants, um, as, as clothiers in the defendant column, but it's a very painstaking exercise and it, it depends upon uh, them being the same person uh, they may have the same name, they're not necessarily the same person. Um, and again, yes, Marianne, you are quite right. I think you, certainly John Lee in his book on the clothier traces um, uh, the putting out system back into the 14th century and links it with the Flemish um, immigrants um, who came uh, with their weaving skills. Uh, my defense would be that until the mid 15th century, in common pleas, you don't see the label of clothier. Um, and therefore, to do this sort of research prior to sort of 1450 uh, would be extremely difficult. Um, but, yeah. Um, and there was Patrick's point, I think, on scale um, and whether the putting out system on a sort of looking at the more intensively industrialized parts of, of the country um, would paint a different picture. I mean, Suffolk was the most intensely industrialized textile county in England, and I think by quite a long way. Um, and the hundreds of Baber and Cosford um, in the uh, southwest quarter of, of, of the county uh, were probably the most intensively industrialized um, areas of Suffolk uh, and uh, John Pound uh, did uh, some excellent work um, on, on the, uh, the, the period in the 1520s um, in the Baber uh, muster roll um, and there's another document that he came across that showed how many people in Baber uh, were engaged in textiles and as I recall he found that about 20% um, in the muster roll were, um, uh, and possibly slightly more once you looked at the documents relating to the civil unrest that followed shortly afterwards. Um, one, one of, going off slightly at a tangent, but one of the reasons why I'm confident, reasonably confident in my data is that in the most intensely industrialized sector of the most intensely industrialized county, it's still difficult to see more than, say, 30% of the population involved in textile production. Uh, this is something I touched upon in my paper. Um, and in order to achieve the output that some historians um, 
have 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 uh, s suggested, you would have to have that uh, sort of percentage right the way across the county and across many of the other textile counties of of, of the country, and that just isn't possible. That didn't happen. Um, but yeah, the putting out system undoubtedly had a big impact on Baber, and when it broke down in the 1520s, uh, we have plenty of evidence that local people were destitute. Um, even William Shakespeare mentions it in his play Henry VIII. Um, gender, um, rather than population, How, sorry, house, household rather than population. I think that was, that was your question, Richard. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's one of the key questions in economic development from the late Middle Ages to the, um, you know, the Industrial Revolution, uh, as to how far uh, children, for instance, were brought into uh, production. And as I understand it, I don't claim to be an expert, but as I understand it, the consensus is that we have an industrious revolution during the early modern period in which um, uh, the family members become far more involved in production than perhaps they have once been. But undoubtedly, um, if you've got a, a textile worker as the head of the household, he's going to look to his fellow um, family members for help. And in fact, you see in, in some of the wills of the weavers, more in the towns than the, than the countryside, the, weavers, <coughs> the male weavers are leaving their looms to their wives, their widows, when they die, um, which suggests to me that they must have been able to operate them. There's not much point giving kit to someone who doesn't know how to use it. Um, and yes, I am sure that the technology transfer in London, particularly in Southwark, which is where the dyers tended to gather, uh, would have been far more intense than it was in the countryside in Suffolk. Um, but we're talking about an industry that wasn't terribly technologically innovative at this time. I mean, the, the main innovation was the introduction of the broad loom, but that was considerably earlier. Um, uh, uh, and the spinning wheel, it's amazing how little evidence there is for the use of the spinning wheel. Um, and the fulling mill, well, I find more evidence for the fulling mill in 1300 than I do in 1500. So I'm not sure how far the filling mill has really developed. You see certain clothiers have got filling mills, um, but I still think a great deal of that was being done by hand. Um, the decline of the putting out system and the factory system. Uh, you're, you're looking at a, a medievalist. My knowledge of the uh, Industrial Revolution is pretty, pretty limited. <laughs> um, what, what I do know is that there were uh, a few experiments in using the factory system um, in the, uh, the early 1500s. Um, Malmesbury Abbey was turned over by William Stump for the production of cloth, and there are sort of um, tales of how many people he employed there, uh, but it didn't last, um, and these examples are very much exceptions. So I, I think uh, the putting out system what remained overwhelmingly the, the main means of production of textiles. Um, uh, yeah, the, um, I think the, the final question was about proto-industry again, which I think I probably covered. Um, technology, I think I probably addressed that. Um, and as I've said before, it's, it's, it's the divorce between, the geographical divorce between where um, the putting out system is operating and where the factory system operates in the 18th and early 19th century. That's the problem with the proto-industry argument, I think. Hopefully that's answered everybody, but speak to me afterwards if I haven't. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are you made a very good job by answering. I think we had a very interesting uh, session. Uh, thank you all, uh, the participants, the speakers, and all of you.
and we meet each other here at uh, three o'clock.